Well, good morning, class. Welcome to the few, the proud the students who come out even when on school is delayed, right? Yes, now you know the real students here are hungering and thirsting after understanding of things. All the rest of them are playing in the snow. Right? Okay, so today it's, um, looks like it's going to be a good day. We're going to talk about bugs and things like that. Yes? So uh, maybe that's why a lot of people aren't here. <laughs> okay. Well, we have with us today um, Irfan Ben Bafai. Bafai, that's it. Bafai, yes. And he's from the um, extension program at um, the Texas a &M. That's right, yeah. AgriLife Extension, Texas a &M. Okay. And um, so these guys, they study bugs and how it affects agriculture and, and things like this. So if you're, you know, peach tree is be eaten by something, you know what it might be? You'd call me. <laughs> call you? Okay. Now, does this include fungus and stuff? Uh, yeah, well, um, we have involved. plant pathologists as well. Okay. Uh, and so they would, I'd be able to refer someone to a plant pathologist. Oh. And um, Reverend is going to tell you about, a little bit about his academic background and stuff before you get started, and then he'll... Oh, I am. He'll, yeah. Because <laughs> 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 I got in late this morning. <laughs> Spicy roads. I was pretty good chance to look it up. And then, Afterwards, um, especially biology people and such, will be having lunch in the Joyce room. And so I would encourage you guys to come out and um, have lunch with us, learn more about bugs and life as a biologist, and the AGRA program here, and how, how far it goes, and all these other things. Um, really the best part of seminar is lunch, so you don't want to miss the best part of seminar. If you're going to have lunch anyway, have lunch with us. And um, that's always good because, you know, if you have a course with one of us, you might drop a clue as to what's on the next test or something during lunch. So it never hurts to um, powwow with your faculty and with the uh, seminar speakers that are here. So let's not waste any more of Irvin's time and let's give him a warm welcome. Uh, so I was born and raised in uh, Canada, near Toronto. I did my undergrad at the University of Western Ontario there in uh, biology. Honor specialization in animal physiology, uh, and you know every summer I kind of had summer research projects working with insects, and that's when I first started really liking them and finding them super fascinating. Uh, one summer I did a project working on cold tolerance of Drosophila, so that's fruit flies. A lot of insects can tolerate freezing uh, naturally, and we're trying to induce it in species that can't. So it's kind of the beginnings of prior preservation and doing it with insects. Uh, so I, I started finding that kind of stuff really cool, and I found it really cool in the context of agriculture and how one can use etymology, something that's so fascinating, to be able to help people. And we'll kind of go through, um, I'm going to give kind of like a general background of just kind of agriculture and some background in etymology and its relevance, because you're kind of like bugs, who cares about bugs? Uh, once you find out how big of an impact it has on your daily life, uh, you'll begin to realize why it's such an important field. Uh, after my undergraduate degree, I then went and did my master's at Simon Fraser University. That's in British Columbia, near Vancouver, in integrated pest management. Uh, so that's kind of the in-between kind of spraying insecticides all the time and organic. It's kind of in the, the in-between where it's kind of like, all right, spray them only when you really need to, but you're trying to be sustainable in your practice. Uh, and then after my master's, I worked on an organic farm for six months to see what the farming side of things were like. So it's really easy to always just be in a lab and tell farmers this is what you should do. Another thing to actually be a farmer for a little while and see what it's like. Uh, and then after that, you know, I had a few other entomology experiences, always had a kind of like short or small entomology jobs and just started here uh, with AgriLife Extension last, not last December, December before that, December of 2013. So uh, my role is, I'm, it's called Extension Program Specialist. Uh, which is a fancy way of just saying you connect academia with the growers and the farmers and I work specifically with the greenhouse ornamental and horticultural industry. So any kind of plants that you don't eat, uh, whether it be landscaped crops or poinsettias in your Christmas time, all those kinds of plants uh, require very rigorous uh, pest management practices essentially. And there's always new insects coming in that you know these, these farmers need to know how to manage these insects otherwise these insects are eating their income quite literally. Uh, so just a very quick background uh, into agricultural history. I'm not a historian, but just, just a quick little background. 
Uh, we think that we went from hunter-gatherers to actual cultivated crops before we could actually even know how to write, before we had invented writing. Uh, and so this is something that dates back ooh, not about 9,500 BC, it is estimated, a long, long time ago. And this is when we just started really manipulating our environment. We start taking crops and start breeding the ones that we like, keeping the ones we like, and not regrowing the ones that we don't like. So we start really changing things. If we look at things from how we think they originally were, so corn, for example, originally around 7,000 BC, we think it was about 19 millimeters in length. You needed uh, some kind of a hammer to hit it repeatedly in order to get at it. Uh, and it tastes like very dry and raw potato. Sounds like nothing you want to eat. Whereas now we have, you know, it's about 190 millimeters, which is about a thousand times larger. It's easy to peel, you can eat it raw, and there's over 200 varieties. Watermelon, again, also something that's about 50 millimeters. You open with a hammer or a sharp object, uh, and it had 18 seeds. It was very rich in fat. And now, well, we have them in four different colors. They are much larger, and if you drop it from one meter height, it cracks open for you. Same goes with a peach. Uh, can you imagine wanting to eat a peach that's 36% stone inside of it? Probably not. So we kept breeding it and keeping the ones that had more meat on them, the ones that had smaller seed on them, and eventually got to a point where we had these peaches that are much different. And so we drastically started changing our environment, manipulating nature, in order to fit our needs and the things that we want. We also then started to really intensify agriculture with the advent of things like irrigation, crop rotation, so we can get uh, nutrient cycling in the soil, and things like uh, fertilizer, like this happy piece of poop right here. <laughs> and originally we used a lot of kind of natural fertilizers, so we used things that were from uh, cattle or from horses and whatnot. And then there was this guy, uh, Fritz, uh, Fritz Haber, who uh, came up basically with how to, well I'm sure a lot of you chemists know this guy, uh, but he from, you probably know this better than I do. Uh, but he was able to essentially take, uh, make, create ammonia from nitrogen and hydrogen and make it into this uh, fertilizer, fertilizer capable nitrogen that we can then put uh, to use in our NPK, essentially, which are essential nutrients that plants need. Um, and he's basically known, his process, him and uh, Bosch, Bosch, am I saying his name right or am I totally botching it? Um, those two together, thank you. <laughs> yeah, two applause. Um, those two together basically created this process that now over half of our agriculture relies on this process in order to actually produce the crops that we have. So as you can imagine, huge impact. And uh, he also did help weaponize chlorine in World War I, but we'll skip over that. Um, and then we also had the Green Revolution, 1940s and 1960s. Uh, and Norman Borlaug was named kind of the father of this revolution where we basically had massive industrialized agriculture, especially in developing countries. Uh, it is claimed that it saved over a billion people from starvation. We started producing high yielding varieties of cereal grains, this expansion of irrigation infrastructure, modernization of management techniques, and distribution of a lot of seeds, synthetic fertilizers, pesticides, uh, and so on and so forth to farmers. This kind of thing really, once again, helped us really expand the amount of food we could produce, but as a result also we started really manipulating our environment. That, along with the fact that we started getting global trade, that animation took me 30 minutes to produce, <laughs> this basically also creates ideal conditions for these insects to go all over the planet. We are transporting both food and the things that go with the food all around the planet. So now we have all of a sudden fields like this, which is very different from what you would normally have. So if you think of this corn, instead of being corn, let's just imagine it being pizza, something that we really like and we all draw to, especially as students. <laughs> if you have one pizza every you know, acre or so in a forest, well, you're going to be quite dispersed and there might be predators around as well, but if there's a huge stack of pizzas, you're all going to concentrate in that area. And as a result, it might take a little bit longer for those predators to come in and for there to be a check and or balance so that we can make sure that uh, the students are being eaten by the predators so that not so many of the pizza can eat. In the same kind of case here, we have uh, these herbivores, when they come in here, these insects that really like this kind of stuff, this is just a giant field of pizzas for them. So they come in here and they're the first things to colonize and it creates a very ideal environment for our pests. Hence we get this problem of coli, now how do we deal with them? We got the magic chemical, chemical DDT. 
So we start spraying this thing literally everywhere. This is on a beach. They're just spraying it. And if you can see the small writing right here, it's a powerful insecticide, harmless to humans. And they're just spraying it just everywhere. It is the wonder chemical. As you can imagine, this starts having quite a bit of an impact on our environment, a little bit on human health, on, on the birds, on our amphibians, so on and so forth. And Rachel Carson releases this book that really kicks off um, the way we see insecticides, the way we use insecticides, and manipulate our environment. And here's a quote where, from her book. She says, why should we tolerate a diet of weak poisons, a home and insipid surroundings, a circle of acquaintances who are not quite our enemies? The noise of motors was just enough relief to prevent insanity. Who would want to live in a world that is just not quite fatal? So then in the 1970s, we had uh, what is called these land-grant universities. Sorry, created a um, nationwide IPM program in land-grant university. Sorry, this is by the USDA. And uh, what, what is IPM? It stands for Integrated Pest Management. So I mentioned that a little bit, uh, briefly a little bit earlier. And the purpose of integrated pest management is to minimize impact on the environment, minimize impact on human health, maintain or increase soil fertility. It looks at long-term pest management, uh, prevent pesticide-resistant pests, and strives to maximize long-term returns and savings. And just a quick note on the pesticide-resistant pests. What we found is when you keep spraying the same thing over and over again on an insect, you're selecting for insects that are naturally a little bit more resistant or can tolerate that chemical. So all of a sudden, you keep spraying and you realize your insects aren't dying anymore. It's because they've become resistant and now you don't have that tool anymore. And so uh, integrated pest management is built on the system where you actually need to monitor to see what's out there. And then based on your monitoring, you're going to do certain control measures rather than just spraying on a weekly basis. And then from there, you have uh, cultural and sanitation practices. So for example, if your fruit is infested with a particular type of insect, you might remove that fruit on a regular basis. Uh, physical, oops. Physical and mechanical, which might be, uh, for example, thrips is a very common pest of a lot of flowers. And what they can do is if you don't need those flowers until when you're actually going to sell it, you can just remove those flowers and you're effectively getting rid of all of your thrips. Uh, biological, which is the introduction of other uh, insect predators into your environment. And we'll go into that a little bit more because that's kind of a little bit more of my background. And then lastly, you're using pesticides, really only when you need them. Your pesticides are essentially like your, your nuke because it's when you have maybe a new insect you can't control or things are just out of control, you need to reset the system. Because once you use a pesticide, more often than not, you're killing all of your beneficial insects as well. So if there are certain beneficial insects, naturally occurring enemies in there that are eating certain pests that aren't really a problem yet, once you use a pesticide, all of a sudden your natural enemies are gone and that insect that wasn't a pest might all of a sudden become a pest. And now you're on, stuck on this kind of weekly spray schedule. And so it can be a little bit of a, a dangerous pattern, but uh, that's not to say that you can't use pesticides. And I think actually pesticides can be used very regularly in an integrated pest management system, but they need to be very selective and used in a particular way in order for it to fit. And so IPM, uh, there's many different components to it. It's not just insects as much as I'd like it to be. And there's also things like plant pathology, uh, weed management, Wildlife and abiotic factors, but the ones we're gonna, the one we're gonna uh, really focus on today is insects. So just looking at insects in terms of what what is an insect in terms of uh, phyla, it belongs to Arthropoda, which is right here. Uh, we are chordates or incordata. If we go further into Arthropoda here, we'll see insecta uh, is similar to Myriapoda, but not quite the same. And Myriapoda are your millipedes and your centipedes, so they are technically not insects. Uh, we also have crustacea, like your lobsters and crabs. And this is kind of my argument for why it's okay to eat insects, because they're very much related to crabs and lobsters. If you eat those things, why can't we eat insects? They're very high in nutrients, very high in protein. I'm going to go on that tangent some more. <laughs> and then we have arachnata. So that's like your spiders. So spiders are also technically not considered insects. So insects, what are they? They're your six-legged Craters typically. They almost always have six legs, they're bilaterally symmetrical, and have some other uh, certain features as well. Uh, one thing that uh, is very important to note about them is that they are ectotherms or poikilotherms in that their internal temperature changes with their external temperature. So, us, we are homeotherms, so our internal temperature stays relatively consistent. For them, since their internal temperature varies with uh, external temperature, 
their uh, rate of development can vary depending on external temperatures. So if it's hotter, all of a sudden you develop much quicker. And as you can see here, this is, uh, uh, this is rate of development here on the side, and this is temperature here on the bottom. So they typically have some kind of lower temperature th threshold where they don't develop. And then as the temperature increases, the rate of development increases as well until some higher temperature threshold where they either die or don't develop at all. They might go into some kind of dormancy. And so what's kind of cool is for us, we experience time in a very consistent manner. But for these insects, they uh, experience time related to external temperature. And the rate of development as a result is also affected by that. So we can actually determine by looking at, well, okay, so this insect goes from egg to larva and larva to adult in this amount of what we call degree days. And a degree day is essentially the temperature above that particular threshold um, in the area, I guess, the area between, how do I explain this? So this is within 24 hours and your daily temperature kind of fluctuates. And so you have some kind of a max threshold and a minimum threshold and the degree days is that area in between there. So within 24 hours, let's say you actually, your, your temperature was consistently one degree uh, Fahrenheit above that threshold. So let's say our threshold is 40, let's say it's 41 for an entire 24 hours, that would be one degree day. So if you had, it was five degrees above that threshold, it would be five degree days, so on and so forth. So it's basically just uh, the area under that graph. And we can use those degree days, knowing the developmental rate of an insect, to basically uh, estimate when those insects might be developing, when they might be on the field, uh, how quickly you might expect them to develop. And that can be very uh, quite important when trying to make pest management decisions. So you might say, from Jan starting from January, you're adding up these degree days. Whoops. You're adding up these degree days, and after a certain point, we can expect this particular pest to come out and be frequent. Another really cool thing about uh, insect temperature tolerance, and this is kind of my why insects are cool rant. This is a heads up. And then I'll get into a little bit more kind of data and research. Uh, but insects have a number of different strategies with dealing with cold. So they can either avoid it behaviorally, they might go somewhere warm, uh, they might migrate, or they might actually uh, somehow avoid freezing, or they might actually freeze. So woolly bears, for example, are a, a caterpillar of a moth that can tolerate freezing and can survive temperatures as low as negative 20 degrees Celsius. Uh, we have insects can also avoid freezing. So Ips acuminatus uh, can tolerate temperatures as low as negative 20 to negative 34 degrees Celsius, and that's far below freezing. I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit. Anyone know approximately what that might be? Or? 20, 30 degrees. <laughs> sorry? Uh, 20, 30 degrees Celsius. Uh, negative 20. Negative uh, sorry, negative 30. Negative 20 to negative 30. Yeah. Negative 30 may be about negative. Fahrenheit. Thank you. This is a very low temperature and they won't actually freeze because they're actually creating polyols or glycols in their hemolymph, which is like their blood, which is an antifreeze. This is similar to antifreeze that uh, we're using cars. In the same kind of way they'll produce these antifreezes so that it pre uh, basically prevents the nucleation of that ice so that they're able to tolerate that very low temperature without freezing. I think that's super awesome. Uh, monarch butterflies, every single year they migrate. So they avoid the really cold temperatures like many people might from the north migrate on down south when it starts to get a little bit cold. Every single summer there is this uh, population here when it warms up in a very particular part of the forest in Mexico and it's always the same spot. They migrate, they fly all the way up to the US and up into Canada and they will lay their eggs on uh, milkweed, specifically one type of plant. They'll lay their eggs on there, their offspring will be born, can chew on the plants, and migrate all the way back down to Mexico before it's cold. There's also another population over here that uh, does this little thing just in the western region of uh, the continental US. And monarch butterflies, they had suffered a huge uh, kind of loss in their populations in the last recent years because milkweed, as you can imagine, is a weed. And so now with a lot of our intensive agriculture farm and better tools for managing things like weeds and insect pests, growers are very capable of getting rid of these weeds. So they can use things like Roundup Ready corn and they can just spray the herbicide wherever and they get rid of the milkweed and then these monarch butterflies don't really have a place to lay their eggs and feed. But now as a result, a lot of people have been planting more milkweeds um, and creating more habitat for them. And so their, their populations are think, they're thinking their populations might start to make a bit of an increase. But it'd be sad to see them really go because they're one of our really beautiful butterflies. 
Uh, pollinators, such as honeybees, so why are insects really relevant, or why should I care about what you're talking about? Um, honeybees play a huge role in our agriculture, and uh, not only just in, in the food that we get, but also in our economic industry. So if we look here, we'll look, uh, you can see the actual economic value in billions of dollars in 2006. The honeybees contribute to each of these crops, and the percent uh, uh, pollination required basically by that crop. So for example, soybeans are 50% pollinated by honeybees, and that uh, contributes about $19.7 billion to soybeans. If we look at something like almonds, that's $2.2 billion, 100% pollinated by honeybees. So they are quite a critical component to our pollination. Without them, uh, you wouldn't get a lot of these fruits and a lot of these crops. Honeybees have some really cool behavior. Well, they'll do this thing called a little bee dance. So uh, they find a really good source of nectar. They will come back to their hive, and they will do a dance. And the angle of their dance <laughs> tell their other fellow bees where that source is relative to the sun. So looking at the angle. And the intensity of the dance tells them the exact distance. They will actually communicate by coming back, doing this dance to their fellow little other bees, and then they together can go back to that nectar source. Uh, and that's just one part of, uh, so any kind of social insect has some very intricate and very interesting behaviors. Going on to aphids, uh, they suck. <laughs> uh, that's how they feed. They actually stick what's called a proboscis into the plant. And similar to a mosquito to a human, they basically suck the plant juices, except the plant can't do this. So they just stuck with that aphid on there. Uh, they have a, a very interesting life history uh, or life cycle. Typically, in your summer, what you'll find is this. It's your asexual wingless females. Those asexual wingless females, they're asexual. They reproduce what's called, uh, using a process, they're parthogenetic, meaning that they basically produce uh, clones of themselves without having a mate with another aphid. So they'll just keep producing clones of themselves, giving live birth to more of themselves, two to three aphids a day. If they start to overcrowd in a plant, they'll, uh, you know, certain cues that be bumping in each other early in their stage or whatnot, They'll start producing winged females. So all of a sudden, they're still clones of each other, but there's certain genes that are now activated that cause the formation of these winged females. These winged females can fly around, can then again produce uh, non-winged females. They go to a new environment, a new crop that is not infested. They create non-winged females, which then can produce more babies. When there are certain cues like short day lag, cooler temperature, or degrading habitat, uh, and that's the signs of the fall. The sexual producing, so you start getting sexual producing asexual females. So the female now starts producing a sexual male and a sexual wingless female. So now all of a sudden you get males and females in the fall, where before it was all females. They mate and produce eggs. Those eggs can survive the winter. And then out comes a new aphid, a foundress, which then again repeats this cycle throughout the whole summer. So they are incredibly adaptive. Uh, that's why they're called uh, the Darwinian demon, because they reproduce so quickly uh, and they can adapt so quickly to certain environments as well that it makes it really hard sometimes to control. Uh, what they do is they, by feeding on the plant, they are trying to get nitrogen. That nitrogen will help them build proteins, to build more babies, because that's all they are is baby producing factories. And then they, they poop out the sugary solution from the plant, because they're just filtering through that xylem and phloem to try and get that nitrogen. When they poop it out and release it onto the plant, uh, you start to get this formation of this black stuff. And it looks like black soot, but it's actually a type of mold that grows on the sugary solution. And that can cover up the plant. It looks aesthetically unappealing, but also can reduce the amount of photosynthetic capacity of that leaf. You also start to get uh, other little critters, like ants, will actually farm aphids. So aphids are sometimes known as uh, ant cattle. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Something like that. Um, but they will basically actually herd these aphids. They'll pick them up and move them to new areas, and they'll protect them because they love the sugary solution they'll feed on. And so whenever you see these ants on a tree climbing up and around, it might be very possible that they're actually herding these aphids. With these aphids, you also get uh, one of their predators. This is uh, now where it goes to the little mini aliens part. This is called a parasitic wasp, or it's a type of parasitic wasp. And what it's going to do here is lay her egg inside the aphid, like so. Here's the egg developing inside that aphid. It eventually becomes a larva that keeps feeding on the insides of the aphid as that aphid continues to feed. 
And then you get what's called an aphid mummy. It's just a carcass of an aphid. And under it has uh, that little larva that's metamorphosed into a new larva. <coughs> you can see it's cut like a nice little circular hole there and come out. And it'll go out and look for some more aphids. And it'll lay about two to 300 eggs in its lifetime. So it'll kill that many aphids and produce that many offspring, depending on the species. Um, but they have this very cool life cycle where they lay an egg. They're, in order for their offspring to continue, they require another species to lay their egg inside of. What's even crazier is that you have this whole battle inside the aphid where that egg initially is releasing proteins to convince that aphid that that egg is just another of its embryos. While that aphid also has some antibodies and things inside it trying to combat anything that is in itself. So you have this whole battle inside there. The aphids can also harbor what are called endosymbionts. So those are uh, bacteria that live inside you. We have endosymbionts as well in our gut. Uh, they have one type of endosymbiont that they require for digestion of the plant material. There's others that have been shown to help with resistance to these uh, parasitoids. So if they actually have them, uh, and these parasitoids are trying to get them, there's a higher probability that they might be able to defeat that egg versus one that does not have that bacteria. That's crazy stuff. It gets even crazier when you add on the other layer of what's called hyperparasitoids. So hyperparasitoids are parasitoids of parasitoids. So you have here that larva that we saw before inside that aphid. A hyperparasitoid is a wasp that lays an egg inside that larva that's inside that aphid. <laughs> it's just madness. <laughs> it's just madness. Um, and so, and there's a bunch of different types of species too. There isn't just one species. There's a bunch of species of these. So there's this, this, this. I'm trying to also demonstrate the complexity of the matter when dealing with etymology and trying to deal with. Uh, control. So for example, you want to control aphids, if you release a bunch of these parasitoids, you might be naturally selecting for aphids that are a little bit more resistant to parasitoids because parasitoids, they have that endosymbiotic bacteria. Or you might be now artificially increasing the populations of the hyperparasitoids nearby. So all of a sudden it gets very complex. You can't simply just throw something into the system and hope it works. We also have uh, pheromones or chemical cues that insects are very attracted to. So here's a nice little chemical coming out of this tube. This moth is going, getting crazy excited about it. Uh, <laughs> these insects communicate a lot more with chemicals than, than we, we do. We communicate a lot by talking. Um, but they will use uh, what's called pheromones, for example. And they'll also use uh, sometimes chemicals that are across different species. So. A plant, I mean, this is what I, I, when I first started finding insects really cool was when I started learning about, you know, a caterpillar can attack a plant, and that plant can release a chemical that attracts a natural predator of that caterpillar. So all these different organisms and all these species in these systems can communicate with each other using these chemical cues. So now let's get to uh, the actual kind of, okay, what does it look like to do entomology research? So let's look at some of the kind of hot topic insects here right now in East Texas. And what are we doing about them? Well, first off, we've got this crepe myrtle bark scale. And if you've looked at any of the crepe myrtles here on campus, you may have seen some of them. Um, they were first seen in North America in northern Texas in 2004. Now they're found in a bunch of different states. They're originally from Asia. Um, they are a type of a scale insect. You'll see this kind of white felty thing on the tree. And they will feed on the plant, very similar to aphids. They're, again, trying to tr get that nitrogen, trying to just produce babies. And uh, they can release that uh, sugar, sh uh, honeydew as well, which creates that black sooty mold on the plant, can uh, potentially reduce the, the growth of the plant and the aesthetics of the plant. And here, are they, here they are under the microscope. Here are the little crawlers. So before there were those little white things, there's a bunch of these little guys crawling around that can be hard to see with the naked eye. Uh, they're very tiny. Here's the tip of a, kind of like a little needle. And they can lay a lot of eggs. Here's a little egg sac that probably has around 20 or 30 eggs. There's a lot of beneficial insects already out there as well, starting to feed on them. So here, uh, this looks often, uh, you know, people who, who look at a lot of insects and are familiar with their pests might think this is a type of mealy bug, which is another pest, but it's actually a lady beetle or ladybug larva. This here also is a ladybug larva. Uh, we might not typically recognize them because when we think of a lady beetle, we think of that, that beetle as kind of round. In this case, it's round and black. It's got these two red spots on it. The larvae look very different. They're almost like little alligators or little dragons. And they just kind of crawl around looking for aphids to eat. Here you can see, uh, here's one of the larvae just eating away at some of the scale. And here's an adult eating away at some of the scale. 
Even more fun is to see an adult lady beetle eat some aphids. You'll notice these little drops right here. Those are, uh, these are organs called cornicles, and these drops just came out when, when that one got fed on. It's releasing alarm pheromone. It freaked out. It just saw something really bad happen. <laughs> Probably its own kid just get eaten right in front of his own eyes. And all these just start, start panicking, because that alarm pheromone is a volatile chemical that alarms nearby aphids to start running. That something bad is happening. So we looked at, so anytime there's a new pest, you want to know, okay, the growers are going to ask, how do I control this thing? So you want to try a number, a few different things to see how can I control it. This, does this look familiar to anyone? Yeah. Do you know what this is? Where is it? Thomas Hall, Davis Hall, Gilbert Hall. Beauty. So there you have a bunch of great infestations for me to do experiments on. And we did some work there last summer, and Kara actually helped out as well. Uh, and so we have a bunch of trees here that we labeled as either having a low initial infestation or a high initial infestation, and we sprayed them with a number of different things. So we had a control, we had uh, soft oil, a mold X. These are kind of like your more natural oils. Uh, and then we had fertilome and uh, bare tree and shrub, and those are imidacloprid, which are a little bit more, they kind of are taken up by the plant and are a little bit more of a synthetic chemical. Um, and sometimes you'll have this case where you'll design a great experiment, but in the field, uh, it doesn't always work out as planned. And that's the challenge with doing field experiments. But here you can see our control. We started off with about almost 300 scales. Um, and then it increased a little bit. And after that, by the third week, um, it dropped drastically. So our, our control even dropped as well. Uh, and here are all of our treatments. And you can see after the second week, they're all still pretty high as well. And the third week, they all dropped as well. So everything dropped at around the same time. It was really hard to tell whether our treatment was effective or not. Uh, it's very possible around that time of the season we started seeing a lot of lady beetles out there. So it might be possible that they were already out there just feeding, so we didn't even need to spray or control them in any way. But we're going to repeat that experiment again this summer and look a little bit more closely and look more at the lady beetles and see kind of what's, what's really going on. Uh, there's also one anecdotal evidence that by controlling, so this is Dimetephoran, which is another uh, product for controlling the scale, and this is the control, and you can see there's quite a bit more flowers on this one, and they measured the differences in the sizes of the flowers, and they found an aesthetic difference. So when you control, it, it basically made them flower more, and they look nicer than the one that is full of the scale. But we still need to confirm that. But as well, you know, growers will sometimes want to know, uh, you know, which, which varieties are maybe more susceptible than others? Because there's certain types of crepe myrtles, there's a bunch of different types of crepe myrtles, but maybe some of them are a little bit less susceptible to the scale than others. So we went to the uh, McKinney Trails, which has uh, over 120 varieties of crepe myrtles there. Uh, there's, you know, obviously different types. They have a history of infestation. We investigated differences in infestation in the summer of 2014. And so we just go around and collect uh, basically uh, three branches from each tree and five trees per uh, variety to see if there was an, uh, an actual difference. And here we can see that, for example, Natchez and Twilight <laughs> were some of the least susceptible, and things like Tuscarora, Lipan, and uh, Pink Ruffles were some of the most susceptible. But in this case, again, this is just observational data. We're going to want to confirm this with actual uh, controlled experiments. We'll actually introduce a controlled number of scale to each different variety in a potted situation, and see whether they take or see what their population growth, how it differs in those different varieties. Because in this case, it might just be maybe uh, Natchez is just further away from the initial infestation. So it might be just a natural distribution problem rather than what's more susceptible. So we can use this kind of information to help growers. And this is really helpful for our actual farmers, which uh, I see as some of the most hardworking and least appreciated people in our society. So to be able to help them is really kind of gratifying. Uh, another major pest is the spotted wing drosophila. Uh, it was native to Southeast Asia, uh, came into America, uh, into continental U.S. back in 2008, and from then just kept on spreading. Um, we found it in Texas in 2014, I think it was actually the first one was in 2013, and then last summer uh, I did some monitoring and found a whole bunch in East Texas, so we, we know they're definitely here. Um, this is what they look like. The name spotted wing drosophila comes from the fact they have that spot, and it is a drosophila, the vinegar fly. Uh, here it is, the spot again, and it's always on that same part of that certain uh, wing vein, so it's a pretty distinguishing feature that you can tell about that species. What is unique about them is that, so most drosophila, most fruit flies, you may notice, are kind of a problem in your house if you've left some fruit out for a while or starting to rot. 
Uh, they can only really lay eggs in fruit that's already open. They're considered a nuisance pest because it's kind of, your fruit's already going bad or you've already bought it and it's already open and it's already infested afterwards. What's unique about the spotted wing drosophila is that you can see here, this is the organ that I use to lay eggs called an ovipositor. And it's kind of serrated, it's jagged. Hmm, I wonder what that could do. Well, it can lay eggs in any kind of soft-bodied fruit just before it's ripe. So with that kind of saw-like ovipositor, it can actually penetrate the skin of any kind of soft-bodied fruit and lay its eggs in there, such as even like an apple. And then what happens is by the time it goes to the consumer, it's going to be full of worms. Yay! <laughs> you have probably eaten this without you knowing. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with that. So potential hosts are things like apples, apricots, blueberries, cherries, sweet and sour, cranberries, grapes, nectarines, peaches, pears, plums, prunes, raspberries, and strawberries. They are basically a whole lot of fruit. And again, why does this matter? Why is this relevant? Because it's a huge industry, and you probably like those fruit. <laughs> so uh, California industry itself, uh, in terms of how much was actually affected, it's probably around 1.5, let's see here, 1.5 million dollars worth. Uh, sorry, total losses is about th uh, 308 million dollars worth, estimated. Um, and that's, uh, that's just for strawberries alone. If you look at all crops, we're looking at something like 393 million dollars worth of potential crop losses just in California due to this one insect <coughs> pest. So uh, we had spoken before about degree days and being able to predict when they're out there. So there is, uh, Oregon State University has published this degree day model, which you can go online, you can enter your location, and it'll tell you when, based on a degree day model, you can estimate to find that insect out there. So you enter in your location, it punches out all this kind of data, and then it gives you, uh, in the end, this kind of thing right here. So it tells you here, March 7th of 2014, first egg laying by overwintering females. So those females that have kind of just been chilling out, not really doing anything in the winter, have now laid their first eggs. Um, then in uh, April 2nd, you get the peak, 50% of egg laying by overwintering females, then you get the first out emergence, first generation, so on and so forth. So we can start looking at this and say, okay, well, that's great, this model is great and all, but how does it actually apply to our field data? You know, we want to make sure that it's actually corresponding to where we are. So what we did was we uh, started monitoring out, outside and we would find, so here it is the average uh, spotted wing drosophila or SWD per trap. And here we're looking at dates. And here are, these are basically some of those uh, milestone peaks that were in that model. So we have the first egg laying by overwintering female, first adult emergence, and then peak emergence of the first, peak emergence of the second, third, and fourth generations. We found consistently, uh, for the most part, there were some exceptions, but that uh, those first catches that we would get were between the second and third peak emergence. And this here is at a lower altitude, and this is in Ontario of 2013. And then we go to a very more northern latitude of Ontario. Again, we found the same thing as between that second and third peak, peak emergence. So by using data like this and models like this, you can help farmers really focus their uh, monitoring when they're looking for this pest. So instead of spending all their valuable time and money and looking for the pest back in June, they can make sure they're focusing it right after that second peak by using that model. Now kind of getting into some uh, newer kind of technologies uh, with entomology, which uh, again are really cool. I think you know, going into the future of entomology are really fascinating. We have, for example, sterile insect release program. This isn't something new, but there's some new technologies being employed with it. Uh, we have this thing called the screw <coughs> worm in the US, which caused uh, about $100 million worth of Lost to farmers in the U.S. back in the I think it was like 1960s or so, um, or 19 a little bit yeah 1940s 1950s, uh, and it affected the cattle industry. So what this this thing did was the cattle they brush up against each other. They might have some little scars. This insect would lay eggs in it, and those worms would feed on it. It could cause infection, and they could basically die. So they were losing a lot of their cattle. So what they did was they got these screw worms. They found out that the male the females basically mate once. Once they're mated, they have all the sperm they need to lay all the eggs they want, and that's it, they're done. Well, what they did was they irradiated some males. So you take a, a rear up a bunch of these males, you irradiate them so that they're sterile. They're basically shooting blanks. They go and mate with those females. Those females are like, all right, I'm good to go. And they're laying all these eggs that are not going to be viable. 
they using that by throwing these males out of helicopters, out of ATVs, and everywhere. They literally eradicated that species out of the U.S. So they took it out of there uh, by '66, by 1980, kept pushing it back. '81 pushed it out through Mexico, and '83, and now there's kind of this permanent barrier zone down here by 2001 where they're constantly uh, keeping them in check and stopping them from migrating back up. So it's really cool to think that you can completely eradicate an insect out of a particular area, like an insect that could be just anywhere. Well, now they're also using that technique with mosquitoes. So mosquitoes are, again, are huge. Uh, they're the biggest killer that we have in terms of animals. Uh, in terms of dengue fever, there's about 50 to 100 million cases of dengue fever per year. 500,000 of those are dengue hemorrhagic fever, which is a more extreme case. And then of those, you have about 22,000 deaths per year, mostly among children. Uh, with malaria, we have about uh, 219, I think it was like 219,000 cases in 2000. Sorry, 219, I don't know what that 219 is, forget that. There was 660,000, sorry? Uh, I think that is, uh, that one there is, I don't know, clearly I wasn't thinking when I put that in there. <laughs> it's, it's about 2,000 in the U.S.? Yeah. Okay, okay. I don't know, I don't know what that number is. So just ignore that. But uh, 660,000 deaths in 2010, mostly in African countries, and that's from the World uh, Health Organization. Uh, so huge, huge impact. So again, what is the, the potential of insect sterile release? Uh, there is this company called Octitech, they're based out of Britain, which is now basically uh, using genetic techniques to create uh, sterile mosquitoes. So before they irradiate the, the screwworms, a bunch of them as a result would maybe be a little bit deformed or you wouldn't get 100% of them being okay, they wouldn't be as viable. Well now they're able to basically genetically modify a mosquito in a specific species that would vector the dengue virus and release it out to the field. And within about six months, they got about 90% suppression of the dengue mosquito in uh, Brazilian trials. So they're starting to get these huge potential, um, you know, life-saving uh, events as a result of these technologies. We also have RNAi, so RNAi stands for RNA interference. So it's a type of RNA that basically binds onto the R other RNA to basically stop it from transcribing to create uh, the proteins. Uh, and there's now some new applications in insect control. So for example, uh, you, know, you could uh, integrate the RNAi, which is going to be very specific to one organism. You could, you could specify it as much as you want it, depending on the RNA that you're targeting. And they can uh, incorporate that into a plant, it's eaten by the worm, and as a result, that RNAi then binds onto that specific gene of that worm and shuts it off, and it might be a critical gene and basically causes it to not be able to live anymore. Uh, there's also some really cool technologies coming out with, I've mentioned endosymbionts before, where now they might be able to modify those endosymbionts to actually be able to digest some of these viruses or human, born, uh, human pathogens that might be uh, inside, vectored by different insects. So there's some really cool kind of advances happening right now uh, in the field of, of entomology. That's uh, that's basically all I have. Hey, well, thank you. Thank you. I think we have plenty of time for questions. I didn't know if it involved this. <laughs> you guys know that scientific research is being done on your campus, like that. Okay, questions for our speaker today. Yes. yes. Um, on the monarch butterflies, I was looking on the internet, and they they have like you know save the monarchs and stuff, and, and they say you know you can plant milkweeds in your yard or or whatever to kind of like promote um, monarchs and, and like give them some habitat. For here, like, would they lay eggs on milkweeds in this area, or would they go more north, do you think? Uh, from my understanding, they could lay eggs here as well, uh, although I'm not too sure. But I know, like, in Dallas, there is the, um, there's a greenhouse there, I can't remember what it's called, but it's at the fairgrounds there. And they have a like a butterfly greenhouse. It's like a double quarantine actual greenhouse where they get exotic butterflies. But then right outside, they also have a monarch butterfly garden where they plant all these milkweeds. And you go there, and that's where I got that footage of that milkweed. It's just a, just an abundance of these. Uh, sorry, 
footage of the monarch butterfly. Um, and so, I, I mean, I think it, I mean, whether it just helps with feeding or they actually lay eggs, I think both ways it helps their population. <coughs> <laughs> Just, I appreciate your talk. You touched a lot, on a lot of very interesting aspects of insects, and uh, I could ask a number of questions, but I'm just going to ask one right now. <laughs> the, the wasp that lays its eggs inside the, the aphid, mm -hmm. so that its larvae can grow and feed off the, uh, the aphids yeah. and develop. That was one of the reasons that Darwin gave for he couldn't accept uh, a benefit. Beneficial God that designs everything, and that was one of the reasons he gave. Mm. He couldn't understand how God would allow something like that, that to happen. To happen. <laughs> and um, so, do um, you have any comment on uh, how you feel like? Uh, how do you see that um, observation? And, uh, do you think that uh, that has anything to say uh, about? About God, God or about, yes, about design? Tough like, question for you. <laughs> yeah. All right, so in my second presentation. <laughs> so, uh, you know, like I, I'm, a, I'm, a bit, I'm a big proponent of evolution. Uh, and I, I believe in the evolutionary process. I think there's a lot of data and information to support that. Um, and so, and, and I think God is something that, I mean, it's kind of always a tricky subject. I don't think it can be investigated by science, to put it that way. I think it's out of the realm of science, and so I, I almost see it as a separate kind of field. Uh, and I think, you know, you can use God to explain things or understand things in the context of science, or you can say that God doesn't exist. I think both ways. I've met scientists that believe in God and don't believe in God and have different understandings of how God plays a role in science. Um, in terms of the evolution of things, I mean, I think, you know, you know I see it as kind of, um, you know, all these kind of natural processes can, can take a direction and, and, you know, kind of do anything as long as it helps the propagation of their species. Um, and so I think in that kind of light, I don't think it kind of reflects necessarily on, uh, on, on a god, unless I guess you have the perspective of a, of a, a god has designed everything, in which case then, um, I mean, I guess, yeah, it would, it would be kind of challenging in that instance because, I mean, there's a lot of critters that do a lot of evil things, a lot of horrible things. And so you'd be asking why are they kind of, why were they created in that kind of way? Uh, oh, yeah, I hadn't really thought of it in that way. We as Christians believe that a fall occurred that um, damaged the created order and injured sin. So I would think that that's where things like the lost lane snakes and stuff. Okay. You don't have to decide to die. Although Darwin said, if you've got things in motion, this happened, yeah. Right. Anyway, those are exciting topics. We're going to talk about that at lunch, I bet. Yeah. Okay, other questions? Yes? Yeah, you talked about some of, some of the examples historically of unintended consequences of the things that we do intended to only modify one piece of an ecosystem, discovering that all of those things are connected to each other in a way that can be very difficult to predict given the inherently nonlinear nature of those interactions. Uh, are there better ways that we have of predicting now that the things that we're attempting to do won't cause those problems? Or is it still kind of a trial and error situation where we do some RNA, I, GMO crop, put it out there, and then suddenly realize it's going to start not just targeting one species we cared about, but two or three other species? Is I'd there say, a uh, control of that? Yeah, I would say as a result of uh, kind of both those consequences that we kind of faced. And those consequences were not permanent damage. Um, as a result of those kinds of consequences, there is a lot of regulatory agencies that are coming and put into place, and a lot of regulation. Uh, the, the what is it? The registration of a new insecticide uh, costs them about half a billion dollars nowadays because of the amount of research you have to do, the regulatory hoops you have to jump through, the amount of this everything that you have to do is, is incredibly inve uh, expensive investment. And so I'd say at this point, we're, I'd say we're at a point where there. We've decreased the, um, let's say, decreased the, uh, the unknowns related to unintended consequences, but it's always still possible. I mean, I think we could always have the potential for unintended consequences. But we've uh, we eliminated a lot more of the possible doubts that we may have had. I think a lot of our, uh, our modeling, our predictions, our uh, experimental rigor has gotten to a point where we can understand a lot of those things a lot better. 
And you'd say you have a high level of confidence in the integrity of the people involved in that regulatory process. You feel like they're mostly not susceptible to political donations or um, I would say, I mean, as someone who's uh, an AgriLife extension, as someone who works in partnerships with private industry, um, I would say, and as a scientist, uh, <coughs> I mean, it, it's hard. I think as a scientist, it's hard um, for a lot of scientists to, to uh, sacrifice their scientific integrity. It's really hard to fabricate data. And, and really live that with, with that on your conscious mind, knowing that you'll probably be presenting in a bunch of places, you'll be questioned, people will probably be repeating that experiment, it's not just you. So uh, scientific integrity, I would say for the most part, I feel like is, is pretty strong. What gets researched is, uh, is strongly dependent on what gets funded. So the direction in which we go in, so whether it be more on the biological control side, organic farming versus a more uh, a harsh, you know, butting heads with nature and, and using a synthetics really depends on funding and, and the private industry. So I think uh, what gets researched might really depend on private, but in terms of the integrity of the research, I feel like, I mean, at least in my experience, um, is, is pretty good and I trust the people for the most part because it's, it's never just one person and one person's study, it's a whole body of science and literature. You know, I grew up in Iowa. Big thing up there, round up ready this, round up ready that. What's that? For growth of weeds and things. It is about herbicides and you know, crops and it doesn't destroy their crops. But how much do those herbicides also affect insect populations? <coughs> well, uh, some herbicides <coughs> can affect some insect populations depending on the species. Uh, for the most part, like glyphosate <coughs> and the, the, the active ingredient in Roundup. Um, is not going to harm too many insects, but it can harm them indirectly. So, I mean, in the same way, however, that, you know, it can harm them indirectly by taking out the crop they feed on, uh, if it's an alternative <coughs> crop. In that same kind of way with using a, a synthetic insecticide that might be very selective on killing just aphids, you're indirectly hurting the parasitoids, even though it might not kill them, you're killing their host. So, I mean, it's kind of like, all right, but I, I didn't want the aphids, that's the whole purpose of it. Um, in a, an ideal situation, maybe what a person wants is a very uh, low population equilibrium, where you have very few aphids and they're being maintained in a low population with a consistent population of natural predators. So that's very hard to do. Yeah. Yeah, any one last question before we break for lunch? Yes? effect on oh in terms of like a, a health impact on yes. us so I think um, so one one common misconception and this is something very interesting I found when I was on the organic farm working there for six months was that there's this huge prejudice almost between organic and conventional growers and there's a lot of misunderstanding uh, organic growers can use can use a lot of can use insecticides can use pesticides uh, they can use herbicides, but they are uh, kind of like a more naturally derived version. But as a result, they're a little less potent, so they have to spray them more often. Uh, and a lot of the synthetics are actually synthetic, uh, uh, synthetic versions of those natural insecticides. So uh, pyrethroids, for example, are a synthetic version of pyrethrums, which, which comes from chrysanthemum plant. Um, there is neonicotinoids, which comes from uh, nicotine plants. So they're all kind of naturally derived and then slightly enhanced chemically. Uh, in terms of natural health benefit, I mean, I always tell people, if you want to get food that's healthier, uh, I don't know if organic is healthier versus local. You're getting local, then you're getting something that was picked when it was actually ripe versus unripe and a ripened on route. Uh, working on an organic farm, you know, noticing what the difference about their food there was that you pick it out of the ground and eat it, and it just tasted a thousand times better than anything in a grocery store. I mean, the tomatoes suck in grocery store. Like, no offense if anyone here sells tomatoes in a grocery store, but um, you know, getting local food, you're actually getting all the nutrients that, that you could get out of that fruit or vegetable. But in terms of you know, uh, insecticide residues or fungicide residues, I have found no data to, to support that it would be. You know, an unhealthy amounts or, or you know, would harm us in any way.
And with those thoughts of food, it's time to close and um, go to lunch.